wasn't proud of myself for the way that I showed up in that relationship. He is a vegan bodybuilder. Nimai no. Delgado. This guy, Nimai Delgado. That book blew my mind whenever I read it. If money comes as a byproduct of me doing what I love and what I love is service, money is just a reflection of that service. Breakups are catalysts, man. Your thoughts shape your reality. So what you think about most, what you focus on most is what you get. Nimai, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. My opening question for you is from someone who is much smarter than me, looks better than me. Uh, it's from my lovely girlfriend, Mariana. You, you've met her. Yes. And uh, I asked her this morning, like, what should I ask Nima? And he, she was like, I give you an entire list with questions. The first one is about your upbringing, uh, because I think it's quite interesting. And she, she grew up in a Hindu community. And I think mm -hmm. you did as well. And I, I don't think that many people know. So maybe tell us a bit about that journey or how it was for you. She specifically asked, like, must have been must have been tough to, you know, go to a normal public school as a vegetarian. Um, I I used to make fun of vegetarians at school. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe walk us through that journey. You were one of those. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's no, okay. I yeah. Um, yeah. So I grew up. In a, in a Hare Krishna community in South Mississippi. And that's very uncommon. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't realize it was uncommon until I was a bit older. So I was raised there until about eight years old. And once I started to gain awareness that, hey, our community is really different than the, the surrounding community. We kind of leave this bubble and go into, um, they call it Maya. Mm -hmm. you know, the Maya is like the real world. In the real world, is it, the illusion that's what it translates to so my parents would always refer to off the farm which was mm -hmm. the community as the illusion so that was the kind of the framework in which i was raised along with all of the other hindu beliefs and one of those of course being vegetarian um following the concept of ahimsa which just mm -hmm. translates to nonviolence and compassion towards all living beings through your thoughts words actions deeds all of it so it was very normal for me growing up in this community because it was all i knew but as i grew older and eventually went to public school of course it brought its own challenges because here i was i remember very vividly going to kindergarten which is a German word. I'm sure you're, you, know, <laughs> you, you know it. <laughs> so I went to kindergarten in more tr traditional Hindu clothing. So my parents were very, oh, no. uh, I wouldn't say unaware. I, they just kind of did their own thing always, mm -hmm. never with malintention or anything. They just kind of sent me to school that way. So of course it was received differently from children who didn't know any better and would make judgments. And um, it wasn't until I was like, you know, deep into like kindergarten or first grade that I kind of really started to become aware of like, Hey, my, my food's different. I have to like kind of explain myself. And then it just kind of kept happening. So was it, it the it, first time that you left that bubble? No, like, it wasn't. Was I, we would, we would leave and venture oh, okay, out okay, and like okay. go get groceries mm -hmm. and, and, and all the normal things. But we would always come back to this community where, you know, it was very communal. Uh, like mm -hmm. I, I can't stress this enough. Everybody in the community had their own role their own position, their their own contributions, their own families. We would call all the mothers in the community mother. So we were quite literally herded, you know, like a group mm -hmm. of kids would go mm -hmm. to like one of the family's house and one mother would watch all the kids and then take turns. And it was, it was very, very communal in that sense. Mm -hmm. And then we had a temple uh, which we would visit at 5 a.m. every single day and then uh, different for different ceremonies and different services. And we'd have a Sunday feast every Sunday, which was open to the public as well, where they would serve prasad, which is essentially karma-free food. It's blessed food. Mm -hmm. So simply by consuming this food that's been offered to the deities and blessed, you are purifying your your vessel. So it's a way to bring in new people that are interested in this philosophy and lifestyle and using food as the the bridge for for that it's actually how my mother got introduced to 
that lifestyle was. What do they serve there? Yeah, <laughs> drink the Kool Aid. Watch out! <laughs> it's, it's just really good vegetarian Indian inspired. Like dal and yeah, dal okay. and rice and sabji and, and and samosas and all of these A really. Good dal and you move to oh, Mississippi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll hook you with it. So that's a smart. It's a smart scheme. It's a smart scheme, you know. So it was it was great. We had Sunday feasts, like I said, where it would be the community, and then people would bring people from outside the community to uh, listen to uh, a, a lecture mm -hmm. from the Bhagavad Gita where mm -hmm. they're explaining these um, this, these paragraphs from the Bhagavad Gita explaining, you know, who is Krishna, what is going on, who's Arjuna, and the, in the kind of grand scheme of uh, a larger story or volume of text called the Mahabharata, mm -hmm. which is a very, just kind of like the more traditional text of, of Hinduism. So that was my experience growing up until we moved out at, when I was about eight or nine and moved into a trailer park in Mississippi being both my parents being two South American immigrants who were also renunciants, material renunciants because mm -hmm. of their uh, spiritual practices. We didn't have much. So we went into a low income community, a trailer park and just kind of was thrust into, into the real world, mm -hmm. so to speak looking back what were like character traits that you i mean probably there were some sites that you looking back you don't like or you didn't like but what what did it teach you in terms of characteristics that you developed mm -hmm. because of it so a couple things that jump out at me immediately the first of which is i learned how to downplay that side of myself, that mm -hmm. background and, and culture of, of kind of who I was, because every time I would go to school, I would hear stories of other kids talking about that community, the Hare Krishna community in a negative sense, because mm -hmm. they didn't understand necessarily the philosophy. They made rumors. They just didn't understand. Mm -hmm. So they would, you judge what you don't understand mm -hmm. most of the time. Mm -hmm. So I would be very reserved with sharing that I was a part of that community or associated with that community. So I just learned how to kind of hide that part of myself. So that's one aspect because I wanted to fit in like any mm -hmm. kid, you know, you want to fit in with your peer group to be accepted, to be feel like you're a part of something and not an outcast. And so I got good at that. And then the other part was the other part was accepting of other people's worldviews because mm -hmm. I was a recipient of being judged because of the worldview that I was raised within. And I wanted to be able to coexist with these people without having to be in constant conflict. So even though I was the only vegetarian and all my friends, you know, went hunting and fishing and all of these things, I never really judged them for it. It was just more so like an acceptance of that's just who they are, their beliefs, their, their, what they do. And we can still coexist and be cordial and peaceful. So it's benefited me, to be honest, for, for what I'm doing now. I feel like that experience really primed me for the position I am now, being uh, an advocate for a plant-based lifestyle and somebody who advocates for veganism and, and animal welfare and uh, shifting over to eating a predominantly plant-based lifestyle because of all the different benefits be and approaching it from a very accepting place of everybody thinks differently. They have their own experience and it's okay to not have to see it my way. Mm -hmm. But if you're open to learning more, I'm happy to talk about it. So not judging, but like trying to understand the other person. And also I think a big thing is accepting that you can't convince yeah. everyone and that is completely yeah. fine. Um, I, maybe that's a, skill that you are not aware of that you probably developed because of that time um but uh, you are someone who's really humble and i think someone who who has so much humility uh humility. <laughs> i was thinking of mississippi humility <laughs> um was just so humble and i think is that is that something i'm not familiar with the teachings but is that something that you know your family um prioritized teaching you that um, that you're not a some like 
special special <laughs> kid that you know what i mean yeah i mean it humble humble can be i guess interpreted many ways it's like there's not too many humble bodybuilders right <laughs> it's like <laughs> <laughs> how humble can you be if you go on stage and flex your muscles and, and you know it's a very ego driven sport yeah. which I, I i'm not denying that i have ego and my own mm -hmm. you know tendencies there um but in, in regards to um learning some of the the traits that i have for sure my mom played a big role into that her um just unconditionally acceptance of, of other people and very giving and, and nurturing and, and just kind of um, always so kind and gentle. I, I really learned a lot from her as a role model. And I think that really helped kind of shape who I am as a person today and take mm -hmm. that with me to, to everywhere, um, everything that I do. So for sure, my mom. Probably also the self-discipline, waking up as a kid, 5 a.m. every yeah. morning. Yeah. How was that? Yeah, I mean, you, just like any kid, you didn't like it, you know. <laughs> <I> <laughs> you didn't, you didn't want to. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but looking back, you know, it was a really beautiful experience because, like, I have so many friends now, as a you know, in my 30s, mm -hmm. where I'm friends with entrepreneurs and I'm friends with different spiritual communities, and they all have the same goal. They're like, I want to buy a plot of land in Costa Rica <laughs> and build some houses and bring all my friends together, and we can create or co-create this sustainable community where we have these core values and mm -hmm. preach about sustainability and kindness and, you know, yeah. all these different things. Yeah. And like, what a beautiful experience that I got to, I was raised in one of those. And it took me a while to realize it, that I, I had such a, a great upbringing and was surrounded by so much, uh, so much experience that's given me great perspective uh, you know, to, even for what I do now, yeah, one million percent. Yeah, but it's like it would be nice to go back to a community like that. Like mm. I, I got to experience that dream that many people. Uh, would you go are, back? Would I go back to Mississippi? No, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely to, not. Uh, I mean, no. Create your own little bubble because there yeah. are. I mean, many of those ideas just make a lot of sense. Like, yeah. um, they are like co-living spaces now, yeah. in, especially in Scandinavia. It's a common thing, like uh -huh. in Denmark, um, where people just live together, especially like families. Everyone has their own apartment, their own yeah. place, but you don't have to cook every day. Every mm. day, someone else is cooking. So you only cook once or twice per week. Interesting. But then you cook for many people. Interesting. You don't have to do laundry every day because someone else is doing laundry every day. Uh -huh. You don't, you can have your own uh, hobbies as a mom because yeah. your kids, like someone will take care of your kids. Yeah. Like every day there's someone, someone else and you live together, you know, in a community and it just, just makes sense. So I think there are many, many, like I would have loved to grow up in, yeah. in a community. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting too, because it, it's always who's, who's a part of the community, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and if if I'm thinking just today as myself and in, in this time period of my life right now, who would I want to be a part of that community? Mm. I'd be very selective <laughs> with who I'd want to do those things with and surround myself with. And, you know, they would have to be people that have certain core values. And um, what would be those core values? Ah, uh, for sure. Compassion mm. being a big one. Integrity, honesty, um, service. You know, things that I really value and I think would be great pillars in a community if you surround yourself with people of that caliber. So um, would I do it? Yeah, totally. I could I could think of many people that I know that I would love to buy a plot of land with and just mm -hmm. say, hey, let's go big. Let's go build a big co-living space out here. Not in Mississippi. Definitely not in Mississippi, though. Yeah. Maybe um, since we're already talking a bit about your story. So you grew up in Mississippi. Yeah. At some point, um, I mean, right now we're in LA. Uh, yeah. It's probably where your base has been for the last couple of years. How did you uh, yeah. end up here? Maybe if you could so just I, like to. Yeah, just really quick. I went to college in Louisiana, which is one state over from Mississippi. I got my engineering degree and then I accepted the job offer that was like the furthest away from the South, <laughs> <laughs> which is California. That's how much you loved it. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I always just felt called to California. It was either California or Florida. I just wanted to be on the coast. I wanted to uh, be at a place where uh, yeah, I had these, these kind of dreams and like maybe romanticized California as this place that was very progressive and a lot mm -hmm. of like things happening and options, you know, growing up in, in the South, there wasn't that many things to do. We'd have to find 
ways to entertain ourselves. And here there's so many options and places to explore and mountains and deserts and snowboarding and surfing. And it's just, I love it out here. So I always felt called to come and uh, I accepted a job offer in Bakersfield, which um, is <laughs> the Mississippi of California. <laughs> if, if, if California was a state, then Bakersfield would be Mississippi because it's, again, it's like very rural. Uh, there's, there's, it's very agricultural. There's like farming, there's cow farms, there's oil fields, there's uh, guys in big jacked up trucks. It just reminds me of Mississippi and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it was just the place where I, where I moved whenever I accepted this position as an engineer uh, for an oil and gas company. So I had just quite literally left everything and everybody I knew put everything that I owned in a Jeep and drove across the country to start this new chapter of my life and did that for about five years before leaving engineering and, and moving out of Bakersfield and just transitioning into health and fitness. Wow. And you left your family, everything. Yeah. In yeah, it was, it was interesting, you know, I, looking back, I definitely felt a calling to remove myself from the environment that I was used to. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was a calling for growth and experience. And also I wanted an opportunity to feel the freedom to be me without like, like showing up in a new place. I could be whoever I wanted to be. And mm -hmm. for whatever reason, that was really hard in Mississippi and mm -hmm. in, in Louisiana, maybe I don't, I don't know why in particular, but looking back, I could definitely, there was a big undertone of me wanting to just figure out who I was. And I figured I'd have to do that on my own. So moving across the country, um, just made sense. And I was nervous and scared and just ended up doing what I knew at the time that how I meet people was through the gym. I would just go to the gym. So Is after work, oh yeah, there's a big, there's a big bodybuilding culture in Bakersfield. That was the first time I'd been exposed to bodybuilding. I had trained in college and I had trained in high school too, but I had trained in college and got more into it because I got connected with these group of trainers mm -hmm. and also bartenders. So that we would, we would, <laughs> we would train, we would train really hard, uh, throughout the week and then party really hard on the weekend mm -hmm. and I still wouldn't miss a session though, but they were the ones that really kind of like, I started to figure out how to structure training programs and, and really started to examine my food and what I was eating in relation to how I was training. So I took that kind of momentum with me to California and just started applying it even more so because I, I didn't have a community out here. So I just went to the gym more frequently and had the means to really invest in like what I was eating and, and being more intentional with that. So I started to see really great results. Mm -hmm. And then that's when uh, somebody had suggested to me to do a bodybuilding show. They were like, Hey, you're in great shape. You ever thought about doing a show? I was, I remember it so distinctly. I was leaving the gym and I just laughed. I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to do a show. Like, first of all, I can't, I'm not big enough. And then second of all, <laughs> I'm an engineer. <laughs> I don't, you know, like it was, it was, there was this real um, sense of, of, identity around being an engineer that I had to be this version of myself that was very serious and mm. very uh, composed and put together mm. and, and not um, curious and, and all the other things that I had kind of made up for myself. So eventually I was like, I'll do it. I, I think it's good to have a goal. I'm not doing anything else. It'll give me something to aim for. And I decided to do that first show about like, I, I don't remember how at this point it was like nine or 10 weeks before the day of the show, I decided. So it was just enough time for me to get prepared for the show. Mm -hmm. And right at that time was when I also made the decision to go vegan because I had watched a, my mom of all people had sent me a video on Facebook and my mom's always sending me videos. <laughs> <laughs> like I can open up my phone right now and I'll have like 10 either YouTube links or reels or in my DMs, my mom's sending me reels and stuff just like constantly. And I watch them, mom, I watch them, <laughs> but, but this one I definitely did watch. And it happened to be a, um, an inside look at a dairy farm. Mm -hmm. And they had shown this really disturbing footage of these cows being mistreated and cows that had literally uh, windows cut into their 
intestines so you could go reach your hand in and see what they were eating. And I was just like, this is terrible. And also connected to all of these pumps and gauges and tubes. And it was, it was, it was oddly similar to the processing plant that I worked at as an engineer. And I had made this connection that I, I, it just kind of disturbed me. I was like, wow, I'm, I'm over here working in this industry as an engineer. Really, my role is to maximize the efficiency uh, of basically the output of these, these liquids, which was gas mm -hmm. through this processing plant, which also has pipes and vessels and pumps and valves and all these things. And then I saw this image of these cows connected with pipes and valves and pumps and all, all these things. Mm -hmm. And I just made the connection. I was like, wow, these, this is also an industry where they're extracting these liquids. And there's a person there that's being paid to maximize the efficiency of that process. And by me buying that product, I'm paying that guy's salary and keeping the lights on in this industry that I don't, doesn't feel good for me to support. So I made that decision to just not support it anymore by just opting out and choosing to not consume or buy dairy products anymore at the time i was a vegetarian mm. so that was a big part of my diet too sponsor of today's episode is vivo life i've been taking vivo life supplements for already more than four years what makes vivo life so special many things first of all they test every single product for heavy metals pesticides herbicides pcbs they focus on creating high quality supplements supplements that i take every single day are the vegan multi-nutrient, it covers potential critical nutrients on a vegan diet like vitamin B12, vitamin D, iodine, a product that gives me a lot of freedom because I don't have to supplement everything separately. Second supplement that I take every day, omega-3 for my brain and heart health, really important, EPA and DHA. Last but not least, number three, creatine. Obviously really interesting for athletes here, people who want to build strength, muscle mass, if you use the link that you find in the description, you will get a free bonus. And if you want to support the channel, always use the link whenever you order. Thank you, Vivo Life, for sponsoring this episode. Let's continue. Were you concerned at all? Yeah. To, I mean, you just yeah. said yes to your first bodybuilding yeah. competition. Yeah, and it, it, it like it wasn't like over like overnight. Like there was a, like a dilemma within me that I was like, your mom kept sending you more, more well it was it was like i don't want to do this i don't know how to do the other mm. thing though so it took me a little bit of a how long was that ago 2015 oh, wow. early 2015 yeah so it's been eight years now but uh yeah i just remember thinking to myself like what am i going to eat because at that time i was vegetarian i was you know growing up vegetarian the main vegetarian options on the menu were normally kind of centered around cheese whether it's like a cheese pizza you know, I couldn't have the pepperoni pizza, but I got the cheese pizza. I couldn't have the beef and bean burrito, but I could have the cheese and bean burrito. I couldn't have the chicken quesadilla, but I could have the cheese quesadilla, you know, like <laughs> things like that. So I like, I have yeah. the grilled cheese, you know, like I just like kind of yeah. really relied on cheese and whey protein. And so when I cut it out, um, I was, I was, didn't know how I was going to react or respond and kind of had to simultaneously learn how to integrate more whole food plant-based foods into my diet. I had to switch over to a uh, plant-based protein powder. I had to kind of relearn how to uh, cook different foods, like including more lentils and chickpeas and things like that. And yeah, it just figured it out while also trying to figure out how to track macros for the first time, which was a challenge because I had hired a coach who just gave me some macros. He was mm -hmm. like, just follow these. And I was just like, <laughs> all right, well, I'll just kind of figure it out by like entering different ingredients into like my fitness pal or whatever I was mm. using at the time to see if I could make it work and then kind of reverse engineer it and then cook the food after I made it work in the, in the app. So that was like my process. Uh, what place uh, did you win the competition? Or? I did. You did. Yeah. I mean, it was a local show. It was a okay. local show, small, so. small amount of people that showed up. Um, and I ended up sweeping. I, I did like the, the novice and the open and I ended up winning like all the categories. It was it was pretty uh, it's pretty ridiculous to be honest. Like they, they this particular organization, the IMBA, which is a natural league, they just give out so many different types of awards. They gave out like best poser, most symmetrical, um, overall uh, class 
class winner, overall winner. So I had, I walked away with like six trophies for my first show. And of course, when you win something, when you do well at it, you want to keep going and you're like, this is, this is cool. I want to do it. It felt really good. And, uh, I remember after the show, people around town knew that I won the show and they would come up to me and ask me, you know, I want to, I want to do a show. Like, how do I, like, what did you eat? How did you train? And then I'd tell them, I was like, well, I happen to, I'm, I'm vegan and I did it plant-based and they're just like, what? You're vegan? No way. And like, it was, it was just an interesting response, but I would see the, the curiosity of people and just kind of the, um, the shock and mm -hmm. surprise by people. And I was thinking to myself, I was like, man, more people should know about this. Like people should know that it's possible and there's an alternative kind of route that mm -hmm. someone could take that could yield similar results to these other guys that are on stage and they should know that it's a possibility at least. So I'm going to keep doing it and I'm going to keep talking about it. And that's how I started posting on social media and it just kind of kept growing and growing and growing. And here we are. <laughs> and here we are. And here we are. And um, I mean, many have seen you and the game changers and are familiar with the fitness kind of, side of your life yeah. um i want to talk a bit about the spiritual side mm -hmm. uh, we we trained the other day at, at goals and talked about uh spirituality law of attraction personal growth for like 60 yeah. minutes i was like damn it this should have been a podcast <laughs> so uh maybe also because it's interesting for me as a creator when did you decide to shift i don't want to say shift away but also open up a new category mm -hmm. uh, in your professional life talking about spirituality and personal growth and law of attraction yeah i think that it's always somewhat been a part of my content but maybe more subtle mm -hmm. because i have always felt like a spiritual person and a spiritual being and talked about you know when people would ask me why i don't eat meat my response was i would share that yes it was for health reasons and but really i'm an ethical vegan i always have been i've been an ethical vegetarian since birth that's why i never ate meat because it was not part of it didn't align with my core value of of compassion and nonviolence. so i would never really lead with that because anytime i would lead with that people would tune out and people would kind of retract because once you start talking about ethics, people can feel defensive. And once somebody's defenses are up, you're, you're not going to change anybody's mind. They're going to stand stronger in their position. So my approach was always to lead with the health benefits mm -hmm. as a Trojan horse. <laughs> as a Trojan horse to kind of sneakily deliver this other message of like, Hey, like you know, there's a way Just to like your mother did. Yeah, hey, exactly. Watch this, <laughs> yeah, watch this video, right? So, so yeah. So it, it 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 wasn't until later that I really started to lean into the reasons and benefits from a spiritual perspective of uh, eating a, a, a plant based diet and kind of keeping your vessel clean in the sense of like everything that we eat is energy. Food is energy, and that energy has a certain vibrational signature to it. And when you think of meat and where it comes from, there's a certain energetic frequency that's associated with that. And if you imagine what it's like for the experience of a animal at the time of death or heading into a factory farm or a slaughterhouse, you can imagine what that experience would be like, you know, mm. chaotic, anxious, terrifying, scared, fearful, all of these kind of lower level emotions, stress, adrenaline, all of these things that kind of don't feel good as in our experience. So you imagine in the animal's experience too. So whenever at the time of death, you know, that energy is stamped and it's imprinted on the flesh and the meat that gets packaged up, delivered on your plate, you cook it, you eat it, it becomes a part of you. This is you eat a banana, a couple hours later that banana becomes cells and it becomes muscle and becomes these different parts of you. It gets broken down and becomes integrated with who you are. So energy is no different. So when you think about it from that perspective, opting out of those energies and opting for the energies that kind of don't have that signature associated with some more plants, it can purify your vessel. And when you have a clean 
vessel that the signal becomes more strong. Mm -hmm. It's like kind of tuning your radio signal to what's happening inside of you. And you can be a little bit more introspective. You can notice the signals that your body is sending you without all this stress and anxiety and all the other emotions that can, that can come. So that's like more of the spiritual reasons to eat a plant-based diet so you can strengthen your connection with source with whatever you want to call the collective consciousness and the intelligence that lives within each one of us so that's that's another main reason why i mm -hmm. am plant-based and am vegan and talk about it from that perspective so i can kind of strengthen my ability to connect to that within me and this side of you like personal growth, spirituality, was that something that came because of your upbringings or was it something that yeah, like at some point you picked up a book and it was called The Secret? <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually never read The Secret. Did you did it? No, <laughs> I haven't fun read fact, The Secret. It was the first book I have ever read. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I read books before at school. Yeah. I don't know how it is in the US, but in Germany, we just use, we read a lot, but yeah. usually it's fiction. And I was never into it. I yeah, just same, I was always same. like, oh, I don't want to read it. So I always end, ended up buying summaries of the book. Yeah. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> yeah. And then at some point, uh, my sister gave me, gave me the book. Uh -huh. she, she gave it to me. It was The Secret. Um, and she said, Axel, this time when you read it, because I was really struggling with life and uh -huh. um, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And she said, just read it. Don't just promise me one thing. Don't judge it. Yeah. And the parts that don't resonate with you, just skip them, but yeah. read it until the end and then judge. And then tell me what you think. Yeah. And I remember texting her like, you know, like there is a lot of things that I didn't resonate with and still like, I don't think it's just a really good book. Um, but there are many great ideas. And for the first time I was exposed to, you know, personal growth and like, yeah. Oh, like, I, my decisions that I make every day, they have an effect on me. Or when I, I, I think it was an example in that book that if you, if you go through a city with a smile, you will have people who smile back, mm -hmm. not everyone, but more people will be friendly to you. Yeah. And if you do the opposite, like people will probably not give you smiles. Like, damn it. And yeah. Also like when someone enters the room, I, I can sense and uh, sense energy. Mm -hmm. So how, how was it for you? Um, a video from your mom? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So the, so I was very similar to you. I never liked reading fiction books. I felt very, it felt very much like an obligation to mm -hmm. read a, a story. And I did not find the entertainment value from the story. I just saw it as an obligation, uh, as a project, an assignment that I had to do yeah. in high school. So I very rarely read for fun. And it was, <laughs> this is funny. It wasn't until... Um, I had a breakup in college and I had kind of like, wasn't proud of myself mm. for the way that I showed up in that relationship. And I had for the first time decided to like do something about it and try to be better as a, as a person. Mm -hmm. And that's when I discovered, uh, I had, I had bought like three or four books cool. and, um, I can't, I can't, tell you that I can't remember the names of the, the other books, but I do remember one book and that was called The Game, which was like not a personal development <laughs> book whatsoever. <laughs> but what I what I learned from that book, The Game is, I don't know if you've ever heard, it, I think it's Neil Strauss that, that wrote it. It's basically like a, a story about a pickup artist and how he like goes to creates this crazy life about picking up women and these mm -hmm. like kind of NLP mm. strategies of like how to manipulate people essentially um but <laughs> to get what you want but essentially it was the first time that i had kind of like forced myself out of my normal behaviors to like try to show up differently than how i was showing up in the sense of like putting myself out there and kind of reintegrating into the world after this this relationship as trying to be a different person and somebody that i was intentional about somebody that i was choosing to be rather than behaving from default mm -hmm you know, mm -hmm. and that was kind of the, my introduction to personal development. I mean, not that book in particular, but that was the kind of, uh, way that I was approaching it. Like, how can I intentionally choose to improve myself? And that led to other books. Um, 
yeah, uh, what is it? How to Win Friends and in, Influence People, Dale Carnegie, um, books about habit and behavior change. Like, I just got really fascinated with how we operate and how we can become more aware of that. So the, the, the challenge here was for me, but I would read these books, but I was very still, very much still in a analytical place because like anybody and like everybody, my childhood was difficult for me and moments of it were, were challenging for me where I kind of taught myself how to avoid feeling certain things and mm. kind of, um, kind of analyze certain things instead of feel them or compartmentalize them and avoid it. So I would read these books and understand it intellectually, but I could never fully embody it because whenever you, whenever you show up differently, you have to, you have to start to the feeling, you know, like you have to show up and feel the things that uh, have hurt you, have, have, traumatized you to, to process those things so you can release them and create space for this new way of operating. And, and it wasn't, you know, I would, I would claim to be a, somebody that was into personal development, but it, but I still had so many shadows and so, so many parts of myself that I was showing up out of integrity and still, I'm, I'm sure I still have shadows and blind spots and out of integrity in certain areas. We all, we all are, I'm not perfect by any means, but I was definitely looking back can admit that I was, and that was big for me because it wasn't until another breakup. <laughs> <laughs> the good old breakups. breakups are catalysts, man. They are such, relationships in general. Relationships, that's where... Romantic relationships are especially are such catalysts for growth. Yeah. 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 If you're, if you have a willingness to, to yeah. open up and. Yeah. yeah. Somebody to, for somebody to, to hold a mirror up to you and say, look, have a good look. <laughs> <laughs> You know? Isn't it funny because <laughs> actually, you know, it's the people we are closest to is it's the easiest to pick up a fight with them. Yeah. Yeah. It's the easy, like the people you want to hurt the least. It's so easy to, to trigger them, especially if you spend a lot of time together. Yeah. I find it so weird and tricky. Yeah. You know, there are so many people out there. You probably like, I'm sure if I would go through the gym and have an individual conversation with everyone, they, there will be people I wouldn't like resonate with. Yeah. Um, but I would never ever pick a fight with them. Yeah. Intentionally. Intentionally, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but like people you're close with, and yeah. I, I'm, I'm uh, you're, you're getting uh, married soon, so yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> interested to, <laughs> to hear your perspective. But especially with my partner, if we spend a lot of time together, I can like, it's so easy to to trigger each other. I'm like, yeah. Why would I, you know, why would I start with, I could start a fight with anyone in the world, but I choose the person I love the most. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Have you ever heard of the concept of Imago? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's a really great book for anybody out there that's in a relationship. I think everybody should read it. It's called Getting the Love You Want. I forget the name of the authors, but it's, it's so good at explaining why we may be attracted to the people that we're attracted to. And there's this concept of imago, which I believe is a Greek word for image. And it is this compository image of the primary take, pri like primary caretakers in your early formative years, the positive qualities and the qualities that you didn't receive from them. So we tend to be attracted <laughs> to partnerships that embody those good qualities qualities because we're like oh yeah that reminds me it feels like home it feels safe it feels like love and then seek out or seek to subconsciously reconcile with a partner the 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 traits or the the needs that weren't met from our caretakers so even if you can look back and examine some old relationships you might be able to make some correlations between your primary caretakers mom dad grandma whoever was most prevalent in your life mm -hmm. and some of the relationships that you sought out and found yourself in because our brain is kind of wired to reconcile that in a sense and sometimes we project these unrealistic expectations on our partners to show up in the way that we didn't receive whenever we were younger so that book 
blew my mind whenever I read it. It makes so much sense and it just allows you to to kind of soften the approach of when you blame your partner for doing something and, and we have these sensitive areas about us when we get triggered that's a that's a sign it's a teacher mm -hmm. it's pointing at something hey, hey this is sensitive there's a boundary that's crossed there's a, a fear that's being had there's a narrative that exists that is being activated right now and you can use that it's challenging to what you have to have find a process to be able mm -hmm. to identify like or like maybe even a, a process to say like hey being activated right now. This, these are the feelings that are coming up. I don't can't explain what it is exactly or, or why it's happening, yeah. but this is what I'm experiencing right now and kind of depersonalize it. to it's not like you're making me feel this way. It's like, I'm feeling this way as a result of this stuff, you know, and kind of depersonalizes it yeah. in a way to where you can navigate those, those triggers a little bit better. But that I've, my therapist always tells me in those moments when yeah. <laughs> one of my wounds get triggered and there are many wounds. Yeah. Um, she says, or like she gave me the advice, one of the best pieces of advice I've ever received, just say, ouch, out loud. When you <laughs> just, and this has been a game changer. If my, my girlfriend Mariana would sit here, she would say like, yeah. Uh, That's funny. Because it's so much easier for her than to see, oh, you're hurt right now. It's not because of me. It's not because yeah. I did something wrong. It's a wound that got triggered and it's my responsibility now to deal with it and not just push it away. And, you know, mm -hmm. it sounds mm -hmm. like you've done your research. Like my, my old approach would have been the silent treatment yeah, and just yeah, say like, ah, everything is fine. Everything yeah, yeah. is fine. Because it, like, I'm also a reflective guy. I know it, it's not a big deal, but when a wound gets triggered, yeah. it feels like it. It big feels deal. like exactly the, the time when it um, got created in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, that's what happens. I mean, our nervous system goes back to, it reverts back to the original maybe experience mm. that we felt whenever it happened, which created the kind of wound, so to speak. And sometimes whenever that wound is reactivated, we, we get so flooded with emotions that even speaking logically, it, it, there's a certain part of your brain that gets turned off. Like the, you have like the, mm -hmm. you have like the, if, for those watching you have like the like imagine this to be like your your early human brain the reptilian brain right and then on top of that we have like the prefrontal cortex which is our ability to communicate with each other this is where that part of the brain is whenever we get activated and flooded with emotions pff, this part goes offline and this reptilian part of ourselves just takes over so even communicating articulating what we're trying what we're feeling becomes extremely difficult so if you can imagine a good way to navigate those moments is to revert back to an early primitive version of yourself where even maybe even a childlike version of yourself, how would you communicate the feeling of what you're experiencing? It could just be boiled down into three words. Like I feel blank. That's mm -hmm. a, that's a start. That's a really good start to identify the general experience that you might be having at the moment. And then you can expand upon that and, and learn to um, unpack that you know, in, in a healthy, in a healthy way. It's just like a good practice to start trying to, to do because most people don't share what they're feeling. They just kind of like imply it or uh, expect you to read their mind of, of what they're feeling. So getting into the habit of sharing how you feel in the moment kind of prevents this kind of build, build up of resentment and all these other things that end up being a blowout and a big fight is like having that little uncomfortable conversation every when it comes up is much more effective than having what helps you in those moments when you get triggered when when a wound comes up for you um kind of just what i what i just said you know just say it mm -hmm. you know like hey, i'm feeling this this way right now like this is what's coming up for me what helps me is to might sound weird but to walk away but yeah intentionally yeah. saying like hey yeah i'm not what you just described, yeah. I, I know I'm feeling that right now. I yeah. can't have the compassion yeah. right now. So I'm just leaving the situation for like five or 10 minutes. I'm yeah. going to go breathe some air or yeah. maybe uh, eat some food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Often I get triggered when I'm either hungry or sleep deprived. Yeah. <laughs> uh, usually, it's, usually uh, it's food. It's, yeah. It's no, that's a great, that's a great actual point there too. I, I think that's a really effective way. It, the, the key is like saying it. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, not yeah. just not just running, just away. running away yeah, and yeah, slamming not... a door and, and burning Drum, burning burning out down the driveway, <laughs> but like just saying like, hey, I I can't have this conversation right now. I'm gonna go self soothe and 
help regulate my nervous system and then come back and be able to have this conversation in a more yeah, Oprah and no. Dr. Bruce Perry, they wrote a beautiful book about it. And that was oh, one nice. of the key takeaways, you know, to not just in my relationship, but also in business meetings. I mean, it's it rarely happens that I get so triggered that someone like pisses me really off that I have yeah. to leave the room. But it, it does happen. And then it's always better for me to, you know, go breathe some fresh air. Yeah. Maybe take a cold shower or best case exercise. I'm always a different person afterwards. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you can relate. But uh, th those are just really, um, yeah, practical ways. I like practical tips. Mm -hmm. um, maybe going back to this this community that you would create. <laughs> what would you, if you could think of a? It's starting to sound like a cult, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, this this so-called community off the grid community. where we're all going to be vegan and uh what else are we going to do do they have to be vegan do you have to be vegan in the, uh, the community in my cult yeah yeah okay in your cult, okay in your cult let's call it cult in no, your let's cult not, let's not call it my cult uh, in your community what would you if there would be some kind of guidelines some mantras maybe what would you what, what would be a mantra that comes up mm. i think you mentioned one i take full responsibility for my emotions yeah that's a good one that's that's probably a good one mm -hmm. is there another one that pops pops up to mind um yeah this is a hard question i might have to like brainstorm this and come up with some tenants for my <laughs> some core tenants for this this so-called cult community uh hummus is served every day <laughs> yeah that's the the only dish um yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. How can I, if something along the lines of like, how can I, like, what's the most loving thing I can do in this moment? Mm. You know, like that's a, a, a good way to kind of approach a difficult decision. You know, it's like, well, how, how's the most loving way I can approach a conversation that's difficult, you know, or, or say something that's going to be difficult to hear, you know? So I think that would be maybe one of them. I'd have to brainstorm to get some better ones, but that's just the first one that comes up. <laughs> and everybody has to train every day, do some type of physical activity. Like they included. Yeah, like they included. Training legs, yeah. Uh, like yeah, yeah. Uh, everyone has to take veg supplements. Everyone. We didn't talk, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk about veg, but yeah. maybe let's co combine those two topics, spirituality and like also business, because I think many yeah. people would would say like, especially with your upbringing, it kind of surprises me that you ended up building businesses because you grew up without materialistic stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, and now you drive a car. I do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting yeah. because there were, that's actually a mindset that I've had to rewire mm -hmm. or reframe around material possessions and money and finances. And because we were so spiritually rich, but materialistically poor, there was a certain almost uh, version to money in a sense that we wanted it, we needed it, but also having too much of it was a bad thing. Like it was mm -hmm. a, like a, a, an attachment, you know, a, a suffering, they equate attachments to sufferings. So that was a thing for me to kind of like break free from this poverty mindset and not to say that it was intentional, just kind of the environment that we, the circumstances that we were in, you know? So it was interesting to break free from it in the sense of not feeling bad about pursuing those things. Mm. And how did you do that? Like, how did you break free from, from that? It being a byproduct of doing what I love. If money comes as a byproduct of me doing what I love and what I love is service, then money is just a reflection of that service. Mm. And I can feel good about that. And, and that can be money is, is a tool. It's a currency. It can, it, it flows in whatever, you know, direction you want to put it towards. It can be something that creates community. It could be something that builds houses it could be whatever you want to 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 use it for but i i had to kind of stop rejecting opportunity and money for a while 
I, I felt bad about having success and that I'm sure maybe some people can relate to that oh, coming 100%. from a humble beginnings and, and having a spiritual kind of upbringing to think that success is equal to um, just negative associations. So mm. yeah, it's been, it's been interesting, but coming back to the business part of it, a business, in my opinion, is, especially if you're an entrepreneur, your business is an extension of you. It's a reflection of you, the individual, and it shows up as, as you, how you run your business, the organization of your business, the service, the quality, the intention that you put behind something is a reflection of you and, and your own discipline and your own intentions and your own care for quality and, and, and service and, and whatever else. So whenever you kind of work on yourself as an individual and become more self-aware, then those changes will start to reflect in business as well. So whenever I started my supplement company, it wasn't ever to necessarily like be rich off of it. It was mm -hmm. to provide something that I wanted whenever I was bodybuilding and couldn't find a brand that had all the things that I wanted and didn't, I, there was, there were companies that, that were offered a vegan product, but their other line of, of supplements were, were not vegan. And I felt it didn't feel great to be sending my audience and traffic and people that followed me to brands that s made money off of products mm -hmm. that had animal products in them. So I was thinking to myself, man, I just wish there was a brand that was just like fully aligned and I felt good about buying from it. So that was kind of like one of the reasons why I wanted to start Veg. And then again, implementing those same core values into the way that we operate our company and making decisions based off of, you know, the customer in, in mind and not so much our bottom line. You know, I could make our products way cheaper, way cheaper if I wanted to, if, if money was the outcome that I was after, you know, and not quality mm. and, and caring about what people put into their body. I could make, I could get ingredients for dirt cheap and three to five X my margins on most of my products, but I refuse to do that because I'm not going to cut corners simply because I know what comes as a risk from doing that is that people are consuming the product that I'm putting out and I want to stand proudly behind anything that I put out. Mm -hmm. So if that makes, if that requires me to scale my business slower, if it stifles my growth in some way, I'm okay with that because I feel good about the way I'm operating my business. Mm -hmm. How does spirituality, the law of attraction and like personal growth help you in the, in the business kind of sense? Man, it is infinitely helpful, <laughs> infinitely helpful. Do you have an example? Yeah. Um, I mean, if you think, if you think business is going to be hard, then it's going to be hard mm. and you're, you're going to, you're going to attract hard experiences. If you think it's going to be easy, then you're, it's going to become easier. It's all about your perspective on things and, and, and what you think about and how you feel about it. And, you know, there's been times where I've implemented the, I mean, I try to really use the law of attraction as a framework for me to make all my decisions and really check in with myself and see how I'm feeling about something and using my gut feeling as the guide for me to make decisions, not necessarily like logic. Sometimes my gut doesn't match up with the logic, but I really trust my, my intuition and my, my inner being, so to speak, that's always has my back and is guiding me towards making these decisions that feel good. And when you feel good and are in a higher emotional vibration, you become more magnetic for whatever it is that you want, your ability to create becomes stronger, your ability to manifest relationships, mm. clients, customers, uh, business partnerships, all of it just becomes that much more potent. So for example, I, I, I share this example because I think it's appropriate for just finding alignment, which what, what I'm talking about when I'm saying like feeling good in your body is, is a scent is a way of finding alignment and, and, and you seeing or thinking about something that is congruent with what your inner being sees and thinks about it. And your inner being knows you to be a powerful creator. And sometimes whenever we have self doubt, that doesn't feel good mm -hmm. because we don't see ourselves as a powerful creator, but our 
inner being sees ourselves that way. So that's when you know that there's some disparity there. And that's a sign for you to recalibrate to your inner being's perspective on it. So whenever you do find alignment, opportunities flow to you. You don't have to work as hard because you find alignment and then take action. People kind of mistake manifestation as this act of just like sitting back and telling, <laughs> saying out loud, I want this. And right, they're like, right. where is it? Where is it? No, it requires taking inspired action. Mm -hmm. And you break down the word inspired. It means in spirit, like living in line with your spirit that exists within you. And when you take an action, when you're from operating from that place, you become a powerful manifester, very powerful. So finding alignment with yourself and then doing the things that you want to do, it becomes a much easier process. So for example, whenever I quit my engineering job, I had so much weight lifted off my shoulders. I would finally left the industry and career that was not making me happy. I was, I was very stressed out about it and anxious and dreadful about going to work every day. I didn't enjoy my work at all. I didn't really care to be there. I didn't care what we were talking about. And, and I like was focusing on the things I didn't care about and didn't like and talking about. It was just my constant reality. And then whenever I, I decided to leave my job, immediately the sense of relief washed over me like wow like whew. i'm a little little nervous because i don't know what i'm gonna do next <laughs> but at the same time i don't have to do this uh -huh. anymore which this was not making a pleasant experience so as soon as i left that same week very same week i got a call from james wilkes and the game changers documentary asking me if i wanted to be a part of this project and boom that happened then again i'm doing what i love I'm, I'm talking about what i care about i'm, I'm like doing the things that make me happy i'm finding alignment I'm, I'm training i'm going in public speaking doing all these things that like help me find that alignment and attract the type of future that i want for myself and then boom muscle and fitness cover boom i i connect with my business partner and we have a, a, a wonderful business partnership together it, it just everything tends to become easier and opportunities come to you when you are doing what you love and consistently putting yourself in that state and surrounding yourself with people that are matching that part of you. And sometimes it doesn't make sense to people that right. like if I were to if I were to tell like my boss whenever I was quitting my job, like what I'm gonna what I plan on doing, they might have had doubts and that might not make any logical sense, but you know, we're here to create the, the life that we want for ourselves. And if you don't do that, you're just going to work for somebody else's life that they are creating for themselves. Reminds me, especially the first part you talked about this, this episode, this episode of books, maybe we should start a book show, <laughs> uh, a book by Viktor Frankl, oh, yeah. Which, yeah, uh, yeah. Man's Search for Meaning. And there is this part where he talks, I'm, I'm probably going to mess up the quote, but it, um, it's about stimulus and your response and that in, in every thing that happens to you, you have the ability to choose your own response basically saying nothing has meaning unless until you give it meaning mm -hmm. you decide what this means to you right now mm -hmm. and basically what you just said is that you, you are choosing the perspective if you are choosing that, that's what you said earlier yeah. if you if you keep repeating this is hard this is hard this is hard it's going to feel hard yeah. even though it's not the reality and i it still sometimes happens today that you know i in my head, it's such a big thing to write this one email, but then you actually do it and it's like two minutes. I'm like, yeah. why did I tell <laughs> myself this? Yeah. And um, I think we never, we will never reach this point of perfection, but I think that's where the journey starts for everyone mm -hmm. who's listening. Maybe you're exposed to this idea for the first time, becoming aware of how you talk to yourself, mm -hmm. becoming aware of the thoughts that you are thinking. Yeah. That's already a big, big step out of, you know, your, your current bubble. Yeah, totally. Totally. I mean, your, your, your thoughts shape your reality, literally. Mm. So what you think about most, what you focus on most is what you get. And you can sit there and think to yourself, well, why would I think my way into an unpleasant experience? Why would I manifest this for myself? Mm -hmm. And it's just a, a, a byproduct of thinking by default and thinking and focusing on the things that don't make you feel good again like 
any experience can be just purely an experience until you give it meaning mm -hmm. and you can choose how to feel about it and you can choose to feel to to feel the thoughts that feel bad or you can choose the thoughts that feel better about it and maybe tell that story a little bit differently and choose to see things a little bit differently you know i could look back at my childhood and, and think of all the difficult parts that i went through and choose to feel bad about them in the sense of like yes they were challenging for sure i'm not mm -hmm. trying to bypass that at all but at the same time, grateful for those experiences because they really led me to where I am today. And they really taught me so much grit and so much about myself and, and, and really allowed me to transcend some of these beliefs that are now an integral part of my coaching and, and, and teaching other people how to believe in themselves and how to retrain your brain to think about how everything that you're experiencing is an opportunity to grow. And even in the moment, if it's really hard, if you can think back of all the other hard moments in your life and how you managed to make, make it through and how that led to another beautiful moment. And if you, you wouldn't have gone through that, you wouldn't have experienced this beautiful mm -hmm. moment. Like there's, there's opportunity to be like, okay, I know this is hard and I'm learning. There's an opportunity for growth here. What is this teaching me? And how can I focus on what the, expansive lesson is in this mm. yeah you can only connect the dots dots looking backwards huh? yeah okay uh Nima, i could keep talking <laughs> to you for the next two hours but, it, but i think we got to wrap up yeah the, the final question comes back to my wonderful girlfriend we played a game yesterday <laughs> and i knew this will be the final question for Nima. Uh, it's a card game and it's called empowering questions you okay. ask your you ask your significant other empowering questions and you think about it and uh, a question that i really liked even though it's really simple is what advice would your five years younger self give you right now <laughs> usually it's the, the other way, way around right? but yeah. i really like that perspective for me, while I give you a bit of uh, time to think about it, for me it was, Axel, don't take life so seriously. Have fun because it was five years ago was the yeah. time when I just, you know, I sold everything I had. I traveled around the world. I was backpacking, volunteering at, at schools in India. And I really, I worked so hard that I forgot um, to have fun. Mm. And my five years younger self would say, no worries chill out like yeah. have some have some fun yeah i think my five years ago would be very similar to that i think he would tell me like dude look at all what you've been able to accomplish mm. and do for yourself like you're doing great you can chill out and, and enjoy it yeah. more yeah. and really appreciate where you are because you know that version of myself was really dreaming of the life that i have now and now I'm living it. So just learn how to appreciate it. Yeah, same here. All right, Nima, thank you so much for yeah. your time. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, it's been an honor. Uh, always, always glad to talk to you, glad to connect. And I just remembered five years ago, I think we met f approximately five years ago. And when you said like, oh, I'm living the life that I dreamt of, I'm like, it's the same thing. But sometimes, <laughs> yeah. you know, you forget of, yeah. you know, you forget what you have accomplished. You're like, yeah. so in the moment that you're like, damn it like sometimes it's good to to mm -hmm. look back and reflect and be proud of what you have already accomplished yeah and that's maybe a th good thought for you my my dear listener to to leave the conversation with to ask yourself like what are maybe three things that i have accomplished in the last couple of years that i'm really proud of and then yeah. it's uh, that puts you into the right energy um, to attract the things yeah appreciation yeah it's yeah. really percent all right if you enjoyed this episode let us know on social media. Um, connect with us. Share this episode with a friend. Maybe your mother or your son or your daughter. <laughs> All the moms out there. <laughs> All the moms out there. We love you. Uh, thank you so much. All right. That's it. Yes. Thank you.